early 2008 uh, was a particularly bloody time in Basra. Um, the British were OK. Um, we were 10 kilometres outside the city and well protected in the bags of concrete like this guy here uh, at the airport. Uh, but the Iraqi army uh, were, in Basra were suffering casualties almost nightly against Jaysh al Mehdi Shia militia. Now, the Iraqis at the time were building a counterinsurgency infrastructure in Basra, partly consisting of a series of battalion bases across the city. But they soon ran out of Hesco bastions, those things beloved by all uh, soldiers. Um, the wire mesh frames, which were filled with sand and rubble, uh, uh, formed the defensive walls we all know and love. Um, and the Iraqi commander, um, General Mohan, um, couldn't get any more of these things out of the Iraqi supply system. So he asked me to help. Now, at that stage in the Iraq war, the British philosophy uh, was that we had to encourage Iraqi self-reliance. Our narrative in early 2008, after we'd left the city, but before we withdrew from Iraq, was firstly that the Iraqi army was now in charge and will soon be gone. Uh, they need to learn to use their own systems rather than rely on ours. And if we keep on helping them, they'll never learn. So our answer to the HESCO request uh, was, if we help them now, they'd never learn. They had to use their own systems or nothing. And meanwhile, nearly every night, Iraqi soldiers were being killed guarding these half-completed forts. Uh, not helping the Iraqi army in this one of their hours of need is not one of Britain's finest moments. And this incident highlighted for me a key lesson, perhaps the most important. And the emphasis should have been not on building capacity, but on winning the war. We build partner capacity not as an end in itself, but so to win a particular conflict. We help the Kurds today, not because we think the Kurds are especially worthy of support, fine chaps that they are, but because we want to destroy the Islamic State. As Marx said, don't forget the war. Now, most people have heard of uh, James Quindleman's RAND study into numbers needed for successful counterinsurgency, suggesting one security force member is needed per 50 of population. Now, however many of our own resources, we or any, any Western country, uh, put into a conflict, it's unlikely we will ever, ever be able to provide enough people to win. So the obvious conclusion is obviously is to use indigenous partners for much of the security operation. That's obvious. Slightly less obvious uh, is, uh, uh, but equally important, is that if the operation is going to work, then it needs to be coherent and integrated. So regardless of who provides the troops, they all need to be integrated into a single operation rather than as treated as separate operations, is what the Brit which would be what the British try to do in Iraq. There was a British expression uh, about the Iraqi army, common in the divisional headquarters. They're our ticket out of here. And this is simply the wrong mindset. We build indigenous forces not so we can get out, but so together we can actually win, combining their numbers, their local knowledge with our capabilities. And once we've won, or at least largely got uh, uh, the threat under control, we can then think about reducing numbers. Now, in Iraq, uh, as most of you will know, the, the, it was the military transition teams, the MITs, who were the, which were the principal mechanism for supporting the Iraqi army from divisional down to battalion level, consisting of maybe 20 to 30 coalition members embedded in the Iraqi units, helped maintain Iraqi professionalism, and since they had comms to secure comms, uh, provided access for the Iraqis to coalition air power and ISTAR. Very, very similar uh, to uh, um, 
uh, Bob Hall's description of the roles of the mats in, in, in Vietnam. Now, the British decided not to embed mitts in the Iraqi army. The argument at the time was that we could not guarantee the mitts protection. Since we were so short of troops in Iraq, we could not provide the mitts with the dedicated support they would need in addition to running our own operations. This was a woeful decision. Resourcing the mitts should have been the first use of our troops before our own operations, because in the end, it was the Iraqi army that was going to win, not us. So when the going got difficult, the Iraqi army's 14th Division on, in the south was on its own, without access to airborne firepower. On one day in March 08, an entire brigade collapsed in under 24 hours, under pressure from Jaishal Mehdi. Over 2,500 troops. Largely as a result of this debacle, uh, Prime Minister Maliki deployed the 1st Iraqi Army Division to Basra, and they brought with them their US Marine Corps mentors and mitts. The difference in professionalism between the US Marine Corps trained and mentored 1st Division and the British trained but unmentored 14th Division was stark. The 1st Division arrived at the line of departure on time. The 14th Division was late. The 1st Division soldiers had breakfasted before the operation. 14th Division soldiers fought hungry. The 1st Division started the operation with first full line ammunition scales. 14th Division started requesting ammunition resupply as soon as the operation started. But the biggest difference was in confidence. All 1st Division battalions knew that as long as their Americans were with them, they had the entire firepower of the United States of America behind them, and they could never, ever be overrun. The 14th Division had no such reassurance. Without the presence of the British, or the Australians, or the Americans, and no access to coalition ice tower and firepower, they were vulnerable to panic and collapse which is, of course, is exactly what happened to the Iraqi army against the Islamic State in June 2014. The main lesson arising from this is it is much more effective to fight alongside your partner to a company than just to train him. Now, one of the main difficulties, and also one of the main differences between our colonial experiences and the modern era uh, is that today we largely work alongside sovereign powers. The indigenous forces we support are answerable to their own independent governments, not to us. Now, the principal consequence of this, of course, is that we are unlikely to have effective control over them. As an example, in 06, General Richard Shiref uh, planned Operation Sinbad to defeat the Shia insurgency in southern Iraq. The only true attempt to, to defeat, as opposed to contain, the insurgency during the British period until Charge of the Knights. But it failed to gain Iraqi political support. Prime Minister Maliki saw no reason to uh, upset the delicate balance of power between the Shia parties, and the British found that logical argument simply wasn't enough to persuade him otherwise. We had not appreciated uh, the importance of levers of influence. Few people do what they don't want to do simply because of logical argument. They can only be forced to do, forced to do it because they can be, we can give them other things that they want. Charm and logic are not enough when it comes to waging war. For example, when uh, the US Marine Corps uh, General, uh, Major General George Flynn took command, operational command of uh, MND Southeast during a charge of the nights, he ruthlessly used his levers of power to get what he wanted from the Iraqis. I was with him when uh, we were arguing with General Mohan over the tactical approach of a particular operation. And George Flynn simply said, that's fine, General, do it like that if you want. But you'll be doing it without the United States Air Force. Uh, and Mohan would always cave in because he knew his troops relied on US firepower for their tactical advantage.
Actually, in 06, when planning Sinbad, we did have levers over the Iraqi government that we could have used. After the USA, the UK was the, by far the largest, the second largest financial donor to Iraq. We would made these donations automatic and not tied them to good behaviour. If we had, the British ambassador may have been able to threaten Prime Minister Maliki with withdrawal of funds unless he supported British counterinsurgency uh, efforts in the South. The two key points here are, I think, firstly, design the operational assistance mission so levers of influence are embedded within the mission, including from non-military lines of operation. And secondly, ensure your commanders understand those levers and use them wisely. Um, now, we talked a little bit about uh, the Dofar campaign in Oman this morning. Um, and during that campaign, the lead tactical headquarters uh, was called the Southern Oman Brigade in Salala. Now, in the 1970s, the commander and many of the staff were British. Now, as Omanis became trained and capable of taking over staff appointments, they gradually started taking over many of the jobs. In 1980, Southern Oman Brigade has its first Omani Brigade commander, but still with many British officers in the headquarters staff. By the 1990s, all the key posts had been omanized, except for some in specialized logistics and training. This, for me, is a textbook example of how to conduct transition. There was no cliff edge from British to Omani command. It just happened that one day, on the routine two-year rotation of commanders, the incoming brigade commander was an Arab and not a Brit. The British Chief of Staff and DCOS continued in post, as did some of the battalion commanders. Eventually, when enough trained Omanis were available, all were omanized. This is the ideal model of what I describe as an organic transition. No fanfare, no cliff edge, no massive handover responsibilities, no complete change of C2 structures, but instead an organic transition where the indigenous forces gradually take over control. Of course, it was nothing like that in 2008 and 2009 in southern Iraq. The system there uh, was to hand over complete control of each province when we judged that the local security forces could deal with the problem by themselves. We then went into overwatch, what we called, where we could be called in if disaster struck. Now, the number of fundamental flaws to this approach one of the most important is that we, the army, were under political pressure to misrepresent the pace of Iraqi army and police development. So we could declare PIC, the provincial Iraqi control, at a time convenient to us, rather than when the Iraqis were truly ready for it. So the key lesson from, from these examples, I think, is that we should plan for organic transition, not cliff edge. The cliff edge is popular with our politicians and our media who love the image of our flag going down and their flag going up. But it's absolutely wrong if we want to win a war. So if there is to be any kind of transition in the operation, we should plan for transition from the beginning and ensure it's organic and not cliff edge. My final point is that not everyone is right for a training, mentoring, or advising role. In the British Army, there's a tendency to choose thoroughly nice chaps who get on with everyone. <laughs> Those easygoing types with bags of patience. But this approach, I'm afraid, is wrong. Certainly it helps not to be impatient. Um, but in my, in, in my experience, uh, success came not because I am impatient, uh, but partly because I respect Arab culture and religion. It helped I speak some Arabic, but the main advantage of having served for nearly three years in Oman in the 80s was that I gained an understanding of Arab culture and the Arab way of doing business 
And that understanding, of course, is key to building respect. And I certainly respected General Mohan, Bantu, who I was assigned to mentor. He had commanded a tank brigade in the Iran-Iraq war, had nearly captured Abadan, and was a tough, no-nonsense operator who could motivate his men to extraordinary feats. And he certainly understood the problem facing Iraq better than I ever could. The idea that I was his mentor was laughable. What we were was a team. Uh, and the key to making this relationship, this team work, was mutual respect. I certainly respected him, and he, I think, respected me. Not because I was a good chap with endless patience, but because I had served in multiple counterinsurgency operations, I had studied counterinsurgency deeply, and could contribute something to the design and conduct of the operation. It's no surprise that Basra's counterinsurgency framework with its multiple distributed bases, checkpoints, observation posts, looks a lot like Belfast's. So the key point uh, is to select people who respect the culture with, with which they're working and who themselves must be worthy of respect from the partner. Nice folks with black bags of patience just won't do. So... I think uh, the key lessons to be drawn, I'm glad to have uh, beaten the bell, uh, uh, from the British experience are, are really four. First is to build effective leaders with which you could influence your partner to do the right thing. Secondly, integrate your efforts with your partner. Ideally, don't just train him, but fight alongside him as well. Thirdly, ensure that organic transition is built into the operation from the start. And fourthly, Choose the right people who can both respect your partner and be respected by him. And it's absolutely no surprise to me uh, to find that this, uh, 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 these mirror very much uh, um, Bob Hall's presentation on, uh, on um, the mats in Vietnam and also, I have to say, Mark O'Neill's 10 propositions or principles. So thank you very much. <laughs> Your questions, please. First, thank you. Just from the name and affiliation, if we could, please. Uh, g'day, sir. Major Andy Maher. Um, just I uh, want to reflect upon uh, your, your British background for the audience. Uh, the, the recent adaptation of the British Army into the uh, reactive branch and the apt uh, adaptive branch, yeah. do you feel that that structural change within the British Army uh, adequately, adequately captures lessons learned out of Afghanistan and Iraq? Um, certainly, I think that... Um uh, we, we need uh, a, 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 a different philosophical approach for the way um, that we do things, do our business, and in particular over selection of personnel. Um, I'm not sure uh, that uh, the stru changing structures will necessarily uh, um, enable uh, the British uh, to do what's really important, uh, which is when we're in operations, be able to adapt quickly. Um, and I'm not sure that we have yet understood what it takes to create an adaptive army in combat uh, so that we are able to adapt faster than our, than our opponents and eventually actually come, come to some kind of success. Um, and when I look at uh, um, the lessons that uh, we collect uh, from operations, uh, we're very good at collecting um, tactical lessons. We're very good at uh, um, sometimes um, adapting ourselves to those tactical lessons. But what we're not terribly good at is understanding the nature of adaption itself and what it is that makes an adaptive army. And I, I still haven't, haven't yet seen that. Hello again, sir. Jeff Cooper, Centre for Army Lessons. Um, 
One of the more common observations we get from our mentors uh, who've returned from operations uh, is certainly reinforcing the, self, the point yourself and Mark and the others have made about fighting alongside your clients. Um, but fighting alongside as opposed to leading is another story. I don't know if you've got any particular observations or point you've seen where, where the British have actually not only fought alongside but attempted to lead their people in battle. Once again, keeping in mind that context of winning the war as priority one, when do you lead versus just fight alongside? Mm. Um, well, I, um, when I went to on loan service to Oman, I became a company commander in the Omani army. Um, so uh, I, I was leading Arab troops, which is where I, I learned Arabic. Um, but I can't see that situation ever occurring again, um, where British officers are, except in perhaps the most extraordinary circumstances, uh, are, are put in uh, direct command uh, of um, indigenous forces. Um, so I think we're always going to be working alongside uh, rather than on top of. Even if uh, there is a, a say, status of forces agreement um, whereby, for example, um, as a British divisional commander has indigenous forces put under command um, in some form of grand coalition, uh, that um, those indigenous forces will still have uh, the ability to go back to their own political masters uh, in the event of any order that they dislike. Uh, and so uh, this, uh, this concept of having to build levers with which of influence uh, so that you can actually get them to do the things that are the right thing for fighting the war uh, rather than some something else related to tribe or individual pro profit motives or uh, um, some kind of political advantage, uh, which is what, of course, is always happening in every indigenous force all the time, unbeknownst to us. Um, so the idea of building levers is incredibly important. Uh, and we all have them. You know, the fact that you uh, encourage, you, you have, like, like we do, many uh, overseas officers come to your academies, come here, uh, go to your staff colleges. Um, th those are levers of influence. Um, what we did in Iraq was we allowed the Iraqi Chief of General Staff to choose who went to Sandhurst, and immediately we lost any kind of influence. Um, so when the uh, Foreign Minister uh, wanted to send his son to Sandhurst, he had to tell the, you know, he had to influence the Chief of General, the Iraqi Chief of General Staff, rather than then coming to us and saying, I would like my son to go to Sandhurst. And then we could have had a bit of a debate and built up our Worcester, our strength, rather than the Iraqi general's Worcester. So it was simple things like that, you know, are, are levers, and we just need to understand them much better and use them ruthlessly. Okay. Now, final question. Uh, G'day, sir. Major Greg Colton, Army Headquarters. I found your um, presentation both nostalgic and depressing in equal I'm measure. Sorry. <laughs> um, nostalgic in the fact that during Sinbad, I think I built two beautiful soccer pitches uh, in downtown Basra, which is my sole contribution to the defeat of Al Qaeda. And depressing because we don't seem to have um, really moved on from these lessons that we've learned. Mm -hmm. One of the things I found in both Iraq and Afghanistan was that it was actually a paradox. And I was interested in um, one of your comments about the Iraqis are the ticket out of there. One of the other things we heard was it's their war and, and they must fight it. If you actually spoke to the Iraqi and Afghans, their view was it's your war that you're here to fight and we're helping you. Uh, in Afghanistan, their concern was Pakistan, mm. not so much the Taliban. And certainly in um, sort of zero, zero, 06, zero 07, it wasn't so much the Shia militias. They were concerned with the Sunnis and the, and, and the resurgent Kurds up in the north. And our war was the war against Al Qaeda. So, how do you balance? Have you got any um, uh, recommendations on balancing as an advisor the two different um, roles? One of your nation, your Western nation, which says we are here helping them fight their war, and, and and they need to do more to win it. 
and the host nation saying, well, we're sort of helping you fight your war. That's the only reason you're here in our country. Mm. Um, essentially, that is, that is a question of strategy. Um, certainly at, at the tactical level where uh, when I got to hit the ground uh, in Iraq, um, um, uh, the Iraqis were in absolutely no doubt that they were fighting the Shia militia, uh, and they were, they were being killed in, in, in very large numbers by, by, by um, uh, Iranian-backed militias. Um, so there was no question that we were involved. In fact, what they were trying to do was get us more involved with fighting that particular war. Uh, but I think what we're looking at uh, is, at strategic level, is aligning the interests of the home nation and indeed ourselves. And if you haven't got that alignment of interests, um, then you've got to seriously consider whether we've got the right strategy. Because um, putting your tactical people on the ground and find, finding they're fighting a different war from the people who they're supporting uh, uh, is it, it, a recipe for disaster. And that's largely what we found in 2006 during Sinbad. Would you please join with me in thanking Rigi Rafa?